Thank you for all coming today. Uh, so this is our final session and this is on the future priorities of for mental health research. So if we kind of like take that apart, that is purely just for students and lecturers and researchers. Just what we're looking to do in the future and what we're hoping what the students of tomorrow, so students start starting next year, maybe in a COVID world, maybe in a different kind of world, who knows? Who knows what it will be like next year? <laughs> um, what we want to kind of give them the tools to kind of help them through their student journey and all that their sort of things. Mainly the panelists that we've tried to bring you today are looking at each part of the university structure. So the individual, we're looking at the structure and we're also look, looking at the policies. So the people that are then kind of defining what universities can do and what they can't do. And we're going to find out a lot about how these sort of things are kind of decided and all these different things. And all in all, today we're trying to, as we look into the future, we're trying to understand that we want to invite this change rather than fear it because of all the people today, like I think everyone understands with this year that we kind of have to just accept that the change is going to come. So we have to accept, invite it rather than keep on fearing it. And with, as particularly with mental health research, we need to allow ourselves to kind of grow and develop from the challenges that we will face inevitably. But I'll pass on to Nicola Byron, which will be sharing this panel. Thank you, Connor. That is a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Um, what we're going to be focusing on today is the sort of the key questions around student mental health research. And I just want to flag there that the, the Connor and his team, the student team we've been working with, have helped put this together. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in psychology at King's College London, and I'm director of Smarten. Um, I'm feeling a huge pressure on my shoulders here because I've invited people to chair all the way through the last two days and I've finally got the job of chairing myself and I'm not too sure I can do as well as uh, some of the chairs that we've had previously because they've been phenomenal. Now for any of you that are joining us new uh, for this session, I'll just do a quick recap of how the session's going to run. We're going to get two minute speeches from each of our panellists and we've got some fabulous people here as, as Connor says with a real range of expertise um, looking at different focuses on the university experience. Um, we're then going to open up for general panel discussion, general questions, and what I'd urge you to do is to pop the questions that you've got in the chat. Um, those questions will be filtered through to me and, uh, and I'll make sure I'll be asking your questions. So please do take the opportunity that you've got here to ask, uh, ask questions of our fantastic panel. Uh, we'll end um, with, uh, with breakout rooms at the end. Um, so um, at the end of the hour, there'll be an opportunity for breakout rooms to chat in smaller groups if you would like. Um, we have the wonderful Laura here. Laura is our network coordinator. And I also should say a huge thank you to Laura because she's put all of this conference together. Which is a phenomenal job. Um, but Laura is a mental health first aider. So if you're finding any of the content that we're talking about today distressing and you just want to chat one on one with somebody, um, you can contact Laura through the chat. Um, you can contact her directly. And she's also putting um, some, a list of sort of support lines um, there for you to contact if you'd like to. Please remember that the session is going to be um, recorded, uh, so we're, we're recording this. We're not recording the chat, so do put whatever you like in the chat, but we're, we're recording this. Um, I'd ask you to keep your, uh, keep your uh, microphones on mute, um, but, but do feel free to keep your videos on and give us a lovely wave um, and use the, use the chat to, to introduce yourselves, to chat to each other um, and to ask questions. Uh, there's more information about each of our wonderful speakers on the Smarten website, so you can have a look there for bios on them, um, additional content, um, find out a little bit more about, about the people we're going to hear from. Um, I think that's everything I'm supposed to run through. Um, oh yeah, we, we're also on Twitter, um, so uh, it's, uh, Mental Health, um, Andre at Mental Health is supporting us on Twitter and, and doing lots of the admin of running, running this whole conference, keeping us going, keeping the tech alive, but you can tweet us at smartenconf um, on Twitter. It's not at, sorry, it's hashtag smartenconf on Twitter. You can see my brain's starting to melt. So, um, before we get stuck into talking to the panellists, I would love to ask you for your thoughts. So we have got a poll coming up that I think Andre is going to send our way. Um, and what we are looking for in this poll is your thoughts around mental health research priorities. Uh, so where do you think future research on mental health needs to be looking? 
Now there's an option on there of other. If you, if you opt for the other, please do specify the other in the chat. Do, do let us know, share your thoughts within the, within the chat on where you think future research needs to go. Give you all a moment to, to have, 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 fill that in. As, as Amy's saying in the chat, it's difficult to make a decision. I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm pushing you to make tough decisions. Go. I can't wait to see your answers. Oh, okay. A decent preference there for understanding what interventions work. And those of you that were at the panel earlier today on what interventions work would recognize that we need so much more research there to understand what works. Um, and gosh, and beyond that, a decent spread. Um, interesting staff mental health is falling really low down there we'll see we'll see whether that's still the case at the end of this discussion um ah and fa fabulous um interesting so the impact impact of exams and assessment is relatively low down which feels like it's quite high up in my list of priorities at the moment because i've just come out of the panel discussion on academic culture where we were looking at all of the challenges that the academic culture creates for our mental health I think I'm going to close there because that links us really nicely to my first speaker. So I want to introduce you to Dr. Eleanor Domit. Um, Dr. Domit is a neuroscientist with a passion for pedagogy. Um, if, you, if you follow her on Twitter, you'll see some wonderful updates from Pedagogic Panda, uh, which lovely memes. Anyway, um, Ellie is really interested in, uh, in, in how we use digital tools to enhance education, which feels very apt for the way we're teaching university students at the moment. Um, Ellie, I know you have been deeply involved in de designing the educational experience for students. What do you think the priorities are for future research into student mental health? Hey, thanks, Nicola. I hope I've, I've managed to unmute myself, so that's a good start. Um, I think for me, there's, there's actually two priorities, and they were pretty low down on that poll, which, uh, so I feel a bit like I need to sell them now. Um, so the first one, I think, is that what we've looked at for a long time in, in university education is we've looked at everything around the education. You know, we have looked at well-being services, we've looked at skills training, um, adequate career support, um, you know, all manner of things. And very little time has been given to looking at the curriculum, how we design it, if it's designed in an inclusive and accessible way. Uh, digital education is a, a brilliant example of this because we get all these shiny new tech tools and um, sometimes we jump on the bandwagon for them. And then we end up in a position where we are using a tool that students are perhaps not that well equipped to use and the whole process is more stressful than it needs to be. So I think we need to look very carefully at um, how we're designing the curriculum, um, how we're teaching, but also thinking about the workload that we're using. We have a tendency to reply to students' demands for things by giving them them but we don't take things away. So we end up with a very high workload for staff and for students. So I think we need to go back to the basics of teaching, what makes quality teaching and what makes teaching accessible and inclusive um, and think about some of the changes that have happened in higher education. So we've seen a massive push towards collaborative learning activities, but actually they could be pretty stressful for some people, um, especially if you then add in a tech component. And I guess the other major thing that I think really needs looking at was very low down, um, and that is staff mental health. Um, this last year with COVID has created an immense amount of work. I mean, work that meant that I calculated I've worked 16 months um, for 12 months salary. And most of that has been done at 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. And the load that is being pushed onto staff um, is leaving them so little capacity that even if they wanted to support students effectively, they have nothing left to give. So I think we can't solve student mental health until we start realizing students are part of a community and staff are often the most uh, student facing of quite a lot of the university community. So I think that's, they're the two big things for me, education and staff wellbeing. Thank you, Ellie. Great uh, links to the to the last session and the, the priorities that we talked about there. I'm also loving hearing your dog in the background. <laughs> um, if we zoom out a little, Juliet, can I come to you? Um, Dr. Doctor, Doctor Juliet Foster is the Dean of Education at the Institute of Psychology, Psychiatry and Neurosciences. I know why we call it the IOPPN. 
Um, and she chairs the Student Mental Health and Wellbeing Steering Committee um, at King's College London. Now there she has the, um, the challenging job of bringing together representatives from across the university to develop and implement a whole university approach to, stu to supporting student mental health. Juliet, can you start by telling us what a whole university approach is? And then maybe what, what researchers can do to help you steer policy? What do we need to be doing? Yeah, thanks very much, Nicola. Um, so I mean, for the whole university approach, we've, we've heard plenty of other speakers talk about this. So both Lee and Michael, uh, I think, gave some really good definitions earlier. And I did have a kind of a longer version, but actually, Nicola, you put something on Twitter earlier today, which I think kind of sums it up. You said um, we need to think about how everything in capital letters uh, we do across universities impacts student mental health. I mean, fundamentally, when it comes down to it, that's what we're talking about. So rather than seeing student mental health about provision of um, individual services for an individual student for an individual issue um, we're actually saying well look we have to think about um, strategically how every single decision we're making in universities as Ellie was saying in relation to education in relation to curriculum but also in relation to physical environment social environment pretty much everything we do in universities uh, has an influence on our students mental health and well-being and there are things that we can do to create mentally healthy universities as John I'm sure we'll say in a few moments this has been at the heart of, of the UK um, uh, step change reports and of course it's at the absolute heart of, of the student minds um, university mental health charter um, as well so as I say it's about moving from thinking about the individual to thinking about those kind of broader community social um, uh, cultural and structural factors um, as well which for me as a social psychologist is, is really attractive because I never see the issue as being just rooted in the individual I think we've always got to see that kind of broader context um, I think that's really complicated from a research point of view because of course as soon as you start to put all those factors in it gets really really messy uh, and I think there are two ways we can approach that as researchers um, if we're thinking about how this is going to benefit the sector and those of us who are in leadership positions um, within it. So on the one hand we can have bigger multidisciplinary multi-method um, uh, studies uh, that do try to, as I say, look beyond just these single disciplines. Psychology is not going to provide all the answers here. The social sciences actually aren't going to provide all the answers either. We need to look to studies of organisations, studies of culture change and so on. So we can think about these kind of multidisciplinary, uh, multi-method studies that really do try to kind of grapple with that complexity. Um, the other thing we can do actually is exactly what Smarten set up for. We can actually think about what we as individual researchers might be doing as being part of a bigger picture. So actually, you know, we recognise the boundaries of what we're doing, but, but but see how that might fit into this much bigger picture if we're trying to kind of broaden this out to the whole university. Um, we really, really need this evidence, as I say, if we're actually going to, to persuade universities to those who are in senior positions, if we're thinking about kind of governance structures, um, you know, procedures, processes, and so on. We, we need to know what works. Um, and as I say, at the moment, if, we've, if we focus too much on these kind of individual um, issues and these individual studies, um, we're not going to have that. So uh, that's, you know, so I think it's critical if we are going to properly show the impact that this whole university approach can, can have. Thank you, Julia. And that was such a, I guess a, a huge answer there. Um, I, I just wonder if, if within that I could get you just to, to circle back and think about one of those points again a bit more and that we're talking about the students and the impact on students but I, I'm very aware from the conversations that we've had across the last two days that these are not a homogenous group. There is such diversity amongst our students and I wonder do you think that there's enough focus on that intersectional perspective in research at the moment? So I think there's more than there was, um, but there's still a lot of a lot of answers that, that we still need. I mean, uh, uh, Jason's um, uh, discussion earlier today about um, black students experience, I think, was really important. But we know, obviously, um, you know, we need to be looking at gender, gender identity, sexual identity, neurodiversity, um, you know, other aspects, commuter students, first in family. I mean, the list just goes on and on as we're thinking about the identities and the experiences that our students bring uh, to their education. Um, I think there was a tendency in the past to approach some of this research and certainly some of these interventions from more of a kind of a deficit approach. How do we make these students with these particular identities fit into our university? And we absolutely have to focus on research that, that looks at how we change the university to enable the university to fit people with different identities and, and different experiences as well. 
Um, I think one of the ways we can do this uh, is by ensuring that actually it kind of circles right the way back to the whole university approach again, because most universities have got really well developed uh, programs of widening participation, diversity and inclusion, student attainment gap, and so on. And what we need to make sure is that student mental health and well-being uh, really kind of cuts across all of those areas so we can make sure that it's an integral part of, of all of these other projects that are going on within universities so that they're not completely siloed. I think that way um, will we'll enable the kind of the growing body of research that shows us the importance of, of taking intersectionality and student mental health seriously to really have that kind of impact. Um, I think it was um, uh, Bethan who was uh, talking earlier today about how, you know, we need to understand not just, you know, what's happening, but why it's happening as well. Uh, and I think that will enable us to, to do that as well. Thank you, Juliet. Um, oh. Yeah, a, a, an awful lot to think about there. I'm just, I'm wondering in, in listening to all of that, if I, if I could invite, the, uh, invite our audience to use the chat to, to tell us, I'd, I'd love to know if we've got anyone here that doesn't work in the field of psychology that, or doesn't study psychology. Do, are we managing to reach out beyond our psychologists? And I'd, I'd love also that, that other question that, yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> um, I'd love also that, that second question that Juliet had is that the other way we could approach this is thinking about how does your existing work fit into the whole university approach? I'd love thoughts, thoughts from everyone here, that if, if you're researchers, um, how, how does your current work fit into that whole university approach? I'd love to know. Now, while Juliet coordinates policy across an institution, we are also really privileged to have John Dupuri with us here. Um, John uh, takes Juliet's challenging job to a whole new level by trying to coordinate at a national level, trying to look at the national perspective, supporting all universities to strengthen their approach around mental health. John has been phenomenally instrumental in this space, driving forward um, University UK strategy, the whole university approach, um, the step change framework. John, can I ask you a really, really challenging question? Who is in charge of mental health at universities? When you're lobbying and pushing universities to, to change their approach towards mental health, who, who are you looking at? Who are you talking to? Who's in charge? And, and what information do they need from researchers? What do, you think, uh, what do you think would help them make better decisions? Uh, great, Nicola. And uh, uh, it is a great and challenging question uh, uh, and uh, uh, we both cooked it up together so I'm, I'm really delighted to be thinking through it with with this group um, in some ways I'm going to slightly sidestep it actually but I hope to a more productive framing of the question which is who leads the change on mental health in higher education because because who's in charge can just be a slightly boring organogram um, but, you know, uh, leading through really important directors of student support, um, SU leadership, probably with a, a senior team, a PVC kind of gazing over it at some point and, and maybe a, a vice chancellor half attentive to the question somewhere uh, uh, there as well. But who leads the change is the more interesting question for me at the moment. And I want to slightly step back and and just say, of course, we all experience our well-being and mental health as individuals. We all have and own that experience. Um, and that's fundamental to to this question about who leads the change. But it's also a collective experience. And as Juliet was saying, it's a collective challenge but also it's collectively in our communities where we'll find the solutions. And that understanding is at the heart of the whole university approach that we've all developed together actually. So um, we, we convened it at UEK. So there's no one part of the system that can really lift this change, that can lift outcomes for all of us, for all students and all staff. And that, that is our vision of a whole university community embedding mental health as a priority across everything that we do. Um, and note I'm using language carefully here, and I will come back to the, the, the language in a second. Um, we're also lifting it as well as across our communities and organisations across sectors because we're also liaising with the NHS and we, we're liaising with local authorities, local government around place. And we're liaising along the life journey as well, aren't we? Across, 
early years, families, schools, colleges, and into workplaces after, after university. So there's a massive kind of cross-sectoral and temporal system that we're looking across here. And no top-down leadership is ever going to lead change in that. We, we know that from complex systems. So this is a classic improvement challenge. Um, top-down doesn't work. This is about dispersed leadership and about user voice being brought to the foreground in that dispersed leadership. This is the way change happens through complex systems. So the second question, very quickly, is what do we need and expect from our senior leadership in this? The people who are supposed to be in charge. What do we need and expect from them? Number one, we, we, we must expect them to see this as a priority. We must expect them to embed an understanding of mental health and well-being as critical to achieving all their educational and research objectives. We must expect them to provide examples and to lead open and uh, inclusive conversations about mental health. It's really interesting to me that there still isn't a single vice chancellor who discloses a difficulty with their own or their or their or their circle uh, circles mental health? That's very rare in sectors these days. I can think of many NHS chief execs. I, I come originally from the NHS. I can think of many NHS chief execs who do disclose mental health difficulties. FTSE 500 companies, many chief execs disclose personal mental health experience. So I, I want I want our leadership to to lead that conversation. I want them to pay, or, or we expect them to pay, a sustained attention to this. And that means resourcing, but it also means evaluation of progress. Only a senior team can do that. And finally, I want them to make the strategic links across government and health. So very quickly, in my last few seconds, um, what do we need from research? We need you to help us understand the need, understand the opportunity, and that means carefully picking through the language around mental health need, well-being, mental illness, and understanding what's required. We need you to help us make the case around how mental health and well-being underpins learning, research, and our economic activities as universities, which will be foregrounded in the recovery post-COVID. We need you to help us understand which interventions work population level as well as individual level and we need you to help us evaluate the progress we're making as organizations and as systems so just a few small tasks for you as a research community Nicola thank you yeah John that's a nice big wish list but uh, <laughs> I, I also really felt was powerful in what you were saying is this this grassroots approach the need to to have small to, to, to act at a, at a grassroots level that that a top-down approach isn't going to cut it um to me just uh, to any student listening to this this says sort of a reminder that right from the very top um from from the from, from john who's, who's leading national strategy around this he's urging all students to to get involved because it's you that are going to make the difference it's your energy it's your voice it's what you're demanding that's going to make a difference. That's going to have power. And I guess along those lines, Connor, can I come back to you? We've, we've heard some absolutely fascinating ideas about the challenges for understanding student mental health and what we need researchers to improve. Um, and I just wonder, uh, what do you think about the suggestions we've heard so far? I think, to be fair, I think most students, and especially me, I think until I kind of got involved with this research network, are quite unaware. And I think most of the systems or most of the advertising that are done by universities don't really make these kind of things available to many students and I don't think many students realize that they have this power or the power of their voice or the power to actually change people's minds like to it like in essence this whole thing has come about because students have wanted to change and students have wanted have, or have had issues and they need something to happen and I think what Judith was saying about the whole university approach I think what everyone's saying about it is so crucial to understanding that because I think not many people realize that every every single decision has an impact on the the way that mental health is kind of like considered and also how people deal with it for themselves and that could be from like the way that your room is built or the way that like university structures are, 
are kind of like designed and that goes from like how even your lecturers for instance like deal with their workload and how they kind of understand how they're mentally lit literate in themselves and also how they kind of help you kind of become mentally literate throughout the year and through with their course um i think all over it's been quite uh, it's been quite magical in a way the fact that you don't really get to see how much can happen with just a few words but i think this kind of just all comes from that and it's just kind of the example of that just at work so yeah thank you connor um a lot there that's really profound i i, I feel we need to uh, sorry not to trivialize things but i feel we need to say hello to juliet foster's cat hi <laughs> We've got some wonderful questions coming in for this panel. So I'm going to start working through those, but, but do keep your questions coming. Um, we'd love to hear them. Um, so I want to start with a, a, a difficult question. I, as, as a researcher, I know this is a really tough question that's come in from Amy's Isle. How do we facilitate the sort of the, the interdisciplinary and the collaborative research that engages students that we need to start answering these questions and, and making students feel part of that? Any thoughts on how, how, how we manage to facilitate this interdisciplinary, interdiscip I'm not going to manage it, interdisciplinary approach um, and work with students? Um, Ellie, I, I know you've been doing some wonderful work lately involving students and I, I know it's, it's, it's not always easy. So any lessons you've learned? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a couple of things. I think um, in order to get interdisciplinary work up and running, it does need money. Um, and sometimes, especially when that is focused around education, um, there are not big pots of money that fund education research. And to an extent, I think universities should be making seed funds available, small amounts to foster staff from different faculties coming together to, to work together, either on an inter, truly interdisciplinary project or to get perspectives from an interdisciplinary group of students on the same issue. So so either of those. I think there is a little bit of an element of, you know, we do incentivize students to participate um, through a payment of some kind, but I think we also need, in a sense, and this may be an unpopular thing to say, I think students need to take responsibility for what they want to change. So if you feel that the kind of teaching you're getting is, you know, perhaps you got made to do a particular type of class and you didn't enjoy it and then you see a research opportunity where somebody is evaluating a particular method that's your opportunity to tell us about it so you know if if you think something could impact on your mental health or you know it has impacted on somebody close to you take part in the research you know it's extremely difficult to get people to come forward i've done a lot of research on lecture capture um, I had no problems getting students to tell me how great lecture capture was when I actually wanted to objectively test one of the features of lecture capture. It was really difficult to get anybody to um, engage with that despite us paying for the engagement. So I think I would say that universities need to support it in terms of giving the financial um, incentives for staff to be able to do the work and recognizing that pedagogic research is still research, which sometimes gets forgotten. Um, and then I think students also, you know, take, take the time to tell us about the things that, it, my kind of view is that if something doesn't work for you and you don't tell us through channels where we can do anything about it, then you have to put up with it not working. So if we're making things available, studies, surveys, feedback, just normal module feedback, feedback on, on services within the university, you have to use those ways to feed back to us because that's the only way we, can, we need critical mass in that data. And that's the only way we can get it. Heard loud and clear there, Ellie. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Juliet, can I come to you for the sort of the, the second half of that question, which was around the interdisciplinarity. There we go. I've mastered the word. Um, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on some of the challenges around working in an interdisciplinary way and, and how we navigate those. Yeah, so I think it's really difficult because I think on the one hand, um, you know, we, we see more and more calls for interdisciplinary research. And, and I think, and I mean, as I said, you know, earlier, I think it's absolutely what we need to be doing to, to, to 
to try and grasp the complexity um, of mental health and well-being in universities but we don't always set things up um, to, to, to make it easy uh, we don't set it up to make it easy within um, uh, institutions and, and across institutions too I mean I suppose I mean again I mean th this this kind of discussion is I think one of the best ways of doing that if we do have these kind of networks that do bring people together at all stages of careers and, and it's been brilliant to look at all the people who aren't psychologists who are who are, um, who are in the chat um, as well here so to, to bring people together around that kind of theme and and then um you know and then enable in, enable the conversation to kind of continue um, although as you know as andre said right at the very start it, you know you, you, you've got to fund it properly uh, if, if it's going to happen um so i suppose we need to we need to um yeah we, we, we need more of these kind of networks and we need to remove the institutional barriers that there are um informal and formal to to actually properly collaborating with one another as well uh, i mean the same goes then for you know when you think about um you know your research outputs and that kind of thing you know where, where what's the best way of kind of getting that research out there so it's not kind of siloed and we don't just sort of stick in the same you know and in our same little boxes thanks juliet um Ellie, Ellie's answer to the last question, I think, I think it prompted me to think about one of the other questions that we've got in, um, um, which is, I, I guess, around, it's, a, it's around this, the impact that this crisis discourse in the sector is having. We're all working in this space at the moment with this cloud of a sense of crisis hanging over student mental health. And I think many people have some question marks over that. Um, I certainly don't think that that, that, that that label is helpful in any way. Um, but I, I think it, there's also a concern that it uh, pushes research to focus on um, identifying good practice and working out what works without maybe reviewing it critically and considering is this intervention needed in the first place? Is there any risk that it's doing more harm than good? Um, is it possible that we're all overreacting to something that's not really, uh, that doesn't really demand all of this intervention? Um, and I guess the thing that Ellie said there that, that's making me think about that question is, if students aren't so keen on coming forward, does that say, well, maybe we're making more of a fuss about this than students are worried about? Um, I, I, big, big ideas there, but, um, John, I wonder what you think. Do, do, do we, uh, how, how should we be managing this sense of concern about student mental health? Um, is, is, is there a risk that we're um, exacerbating it rather than focusing on, on the possible risks of intervening? Yes, and undermining ourselves with the, with the crisis narrative. And um, I, I'm very uh, minded by uh, uh, and, and take very seriously Catherine's uh, comments in the chat about a uh, kind of lazy use of language which conflates a uh, sort of crisis narrative uh, with a, a, a more kind of nuanced and useful definition of need but also of opportunity as well so um, I, I wanted just to say it's it's complicated all this stuff but we aren't the only people doing this kind of thing and as Andre will know from his wider work across health services research and and the health sector there are there are kind of very successful multidisciplinary approaches building in user voice in for example major health system change and we could borrow a lot from academics who are working in those kind of complex multidisciplinary system changes like investing in you know entirely new health service infrastructure across greater manchester for example that's the kind of scale of public health change that that we're talking about with this I mean, back to the point about crisis i i i think we're we're actually in a time now with covid and the pandemic where uh, for the first time probably some of that crisis narrative is probably more apt than it has been in the past and i think that's because we need to react very quickly not to deal with uh, a crisis around chronic mental illness because i don't think that is expressed yet but to deal with a, a an absolutely overwhelming wave of some of the determinants of poor mental health and I'm talking about uncertainty, isolation, financial hardship, all of the very well-evidenced determinants of chronic mental illness. So 
So I think uh, in general terms, no, I very much try and avoid the crisis narrative. Um, but I, I think at the moment with the pandemic, we really do need to react quickly, if you like, to flatten this curve. We talk a lot about flattening the COVID curve, but there's a, there's a curve of, of determinants of poor mental health that we really need to act on now uh, and need to act on with prevention and early intervention in order to get ahead of a, of a generation who might be susceptible to poor mental health uh, in the years to come. Thank you, John. I, um, I quite a scary thought there for us. Um, challenging. I, I, I wonder, Ellie, Ellie Juliet, whether either of you want to come on, come in on that, or would you like me to move on? Et Juliet. Yeah, no, so just, just quite a quick point. I think it, it picks up in some of the comments on the chat as well. Um, I mean, I still think that there's work to do around us actually understanding what students and staff within universities actually mean when they're talking about mental health and well-being uh, in and of itself. I mean, my, my work, you know, going back sort of 20 years has looked at uh, understandings of the mental health problems and I mean you know what you come up against time and time and time again is people aren't talking about the same thing you know in different in different contexts and different cultures and so on um, and I think I think it would be really useful to have some more research on actually what what these definitions and what this understanding means with you know to, to different groups within the sector absolutely and Juliet, I, I read that echoed quite clearly in Amy's comment earlier about saying that she, she went to university in 2012 where there was a crisis in higher education then and uh, she's really asking when would it, when would it, why is it still a crisis, when would it quantifiably not be a crisis anymore, can we define when it wouldn't be a crisis and I think that's a huge question for us as researchers to, to work out when, when would we stop calling it a crisis. Um, so just to take us from one really difficult question straight into another really difficult question. Um, uh, oh, I'm going to really make a mess of your name. I'm sorry, but Humeria, hum, I think uh, you've been asking wonderful questions over the last two days. And I really, really like this, this, this last question that I've got from you, um, which is the, that we're looking at, we recognize that there were individual factors that contribute to poor mental health. Um, there are also social determinants and that wider context, a wider institutional context um, in Black student mental health. How do we navigate that divide in our future research, recognising both um, and that both have an, have an impact? Do, do we risk, is there always a risk that we look at one rather than the other? Can we look at both at the same time effectively? Um, you're all looking at me going, oh, don't, don't, don't. Um, Ellie, I think it's your turn to try and take a difficult question. I knew you were going to do that. Um, I'm going to say that, yes, we can look at them both effectively, because if we can't, Nicola and I have wasted a lot of time on a research proposal recently. Um, I think we, we do need to understand um, more around the, the wider context of the student's life. And we can't, you know, some of those are individual factors. It does, does the student have caring responsibilities? Are they um, commuting some distance? What were their school experiences like? Because ultimately, um, pre people's previous educational experiences massively impact on the next educational experience they have. We know that. Um, but I think we also can be looking at some of these institutional-wide factors. So one of the things that I is sort of one of my bugbears that I'm interested in at the moment is looking at what happens when we give students choice. Now, on the surface of that, that sounds great. Let's give students choice. They can do, you know, maybe 60 credits in their home department. They can go off and they can do whatever they like. And that's great. Yes, it all sounds great. But what's missing there is a sense of coherence in their experience that you get from um, your teaching being done in a particular way, being being aware of the requirements of your program, seeing the same people quite regularly. So there is this sense of belonging that can come from being part of the department or even part of a program within a department. I know that, um, you know, the IOPPN is, is a very strange beast in that it was separate from King's and now it's part of it, but people still talk of themselves being at IOPPN, not at King's. Um, so there's this sense of belonging. And I worry that as we start to say, well, we need to diversify everything and give the students the option to go and do X, Y, Z, that one of the things we're doing is we're reducing any sense of belonging and we're reducing coherence 
in their university experience, which can have a negative effect. Now that may not be true, we don't know because people haven't tested it and I think we need to test it, but I think we do need to be looking at factors, individual factors around, you know, demographic factors, of course, but also um, the digital skills, really important thing to think about. So we can see what the individual students are bringing with them their experiences, but we can also see the experiences we are shaping for them. So things like a sense of belonging in a department, a sense of coherence to your degree program, um, support if you go off for a year abroad or a placement year, do they forget about you or do they keep in touch with you? All of these big things, and we can look at those, they just require, um, it, again, it's a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to get people into these studies and retained in them. One thing we lack in education research is it's really difficult to take a cohort from the day they arrive at university or better still beforehand and follow them through to graduation and and unless you've got that kind of study there is only so much you're going to get you know what we know about students two years ago most of it won't apply to the group that are trying to learn to study online in the middle of a pandemic now okay we couldn't have predicted that but the point is we don't have enough longitudinal studies to really get a handle on things at the moment um, Elia, I thought, thought some, something in there so profound is that we, we seem to have different institutional pushes that we should give to students choice and make them belong more, but, but seemingly at the moment really conflicting. Um, I, I'm aware, John, you want to come in on this. So do you, do you have some wisdom for us here? Uh, I'm not sure about wisdom, but your question was how do we navigate the divide? And I think, wow. I think the simple answer is let's not navigate the divide. I think all of this matters. Um, and you know different researchers will pick off different aspects of it i mean your head will explode nicola because you have to run a research network that looks across all of this your, yours and laura's and others but but uh, you know we don't navigate the divide we recognize this is a complex challenge and opportunity health is an individual and social goal we know that now in the pandemic better than we ever knew it a year ago. So, you know, no one can avoid that understanding. So let's deploy all of our disciplines and all of our energies to achieving that goal with research as one of the kind of cogwheels that takes us there. So um, I'm afraid no, no navigation. I think, I think that's wonderful, John, a really sound point that we need to fund work across all of this. I'm going to move on because we've got... Can I, can I come in really, really oh, super quickly, yeah. Baron? Okay. Just, just to say that we're not very good as researchers at actually acknowledging that when, when we can't, when we, when we, when we aren't, we, we, we're not very good at recognising the boundaries of our work and, and owning those. And we should do more of that. We should say, yeah, this is part of the story, but it's only part of the story. Um, we're not very good at doing that as academics. I think, I think that's so important, Juliet, isn't it? Because it lets us then act as jigsaw puzzles and, and fit together to put the, to put the bigger picture together. I've got I've got a question that's come in that I'm I'm a bit passionate about I think and and uh, it came rather low down on the list of research priorities but around staff mental health and this is a question that's been asked by Elsa who's been doing lots of work around staff mental health lately um, and thank you Elsa for all the work you're doing there it's so important um, she's she's asking a question about whether well, I'm assuming I'm, I'm reading into this question but that. But as we have allowed the increased marketization of our universities, has it got harder to look at staff and student mental health in parallel? Um, is, it, is, it, is it tougher to look at them together? And how in a, in a new situation where we, well, not, it's not new anymore, is it? But in, in an increasing situation where we're marketizing universities, do we bring research and understanding around staff and student mental health together? El Elsa asks whether there are examples from um, other countries where education is free, but I, I think I know, I know our panel is all UK based, so they might struggle answering that one. Um, but I, I think Elsa, you might have some answers for us on that. But um, Juliet, could I, could I come to you for a thought on that about whether the change in how universities are, are run and the, the market pressures is, is changing how, how we look at staff and students alongside each other? Oh, I knew you were going to come to me first on that one. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think this is a real challenge. I think it's a really important issue. And I mean, it comes back to some of the discussions. I think it was in one of the sessions yesterday where we were talking about, um, you know, this, this kind of mismatch you get really between this kind of promise of university as being, you know, the best time of your life and this kind of all singing, all dancing experience. And then 
actually, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the reality. Uh, and I think that um, actually, if we're, if we're being honest with students about, you know, the, what, what universities can do and what preparation, you know, is needed and those sorts of things, that doesn't always sit well with, with some of the market um, marketing departments, you know, who, who want to continue to push a particular narrative. Um, so I, I think I think I think we need greater honesty, kind of across the board, really, actually, um, because the, the, you know the, there's there's an issue of, around expectation setting about what universities can do and and, and what they can't do, which I, I don't think we manage brilliantly well at the moment. I suppose maybe actually it kind of comes back to some of the points that Ellie was making right at the very beginning as well. If we kind of think about if we think about I mean fundamentally, um, you know. Students come to university because they're going to get a degree, you know, so we've got that kind of single point of contact with all of them is their education, you know, the extra stuff that we might try to put on in terms of support, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, um, not all of them are going to take it up and, um, you know, but, but, the, but the curriculum, the education is there. So if we get that bit right, um, then potentially that's got benefits for the, for the mental health and wellbeing of the students, but also for staff as well, because it, it, it stops or it sets some of those expectations in a different kind of way um but but i i think i think it's a real struggle i'd be fascinated to hear if we have got anybody in the audience who is from a, a country where education is free and isn't marketized in this in this same sort of way um i'd be i'd be really interested to hear but across the course of my career i mean i've you know i i i'm old enough to remember you know a time when when tuition fees weren't, weren't a thing and i and i think i have seen a shift um actually over that time uh, in the pressures that students are actually um actually report as well which i think is it has had that knock-on effect on staff as well it's not really an answer it's just raising more questions <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that's the risk of putting a group of researchers on the panel. Can I, can, can I, can I come to you, John, maybe for, for some answers? How, how do you think marketisation has changed that relationship between staff and students? I mean, I'm definitely not uh, going to argue for the marketised sector. Um, but I do think we need to be a little bit careful, if you like, with what the negative hypothesis is here, which is that in entirely state sectors there is a joyful experience of mental health and well-being and indeed of the staff student relationship so i think there are wider factors than the marketized sector i think where it particularly bears is in staff workload staff um, working conditions some of the kind of cultural drivers around research culture and how that bleeds across into teaching cultures again around overwork um, and not setting boundaries on work that's on the staff side i think those can be addressed should be addressed within the current system um you know i don't think we need a an entire revolution before we can address some of those key factors uh, within the student body, I think that hardship and uh, some of the kind of, you know, on course consequences of the current system uh, are, are, are real drivers of poor well-being and poor mental health. I think some of the structures of student accommodation um, and particularly the private rented sector are, are really, really um, poor outcomes from the current system but again i do think these can be addressed within the current system must be actually and i've just um joined a, an nus project on um a kind of uh, a campaign on fair rents for uh, the coming 12 months so i think i think there's interest actually you'd be surprised at the interest within the sector leadership on kind of moving some of these key agenda points so i'm not going to argue for or against marketization but I, I do think that we do need to consider the negative hypothesis and recognize that there's a little bit of grass is greener or grass was greener um going on here as well i, I recognize that might be a minority view but anyway thought i'd put that out there okay interesting um I, i've got um but another another question that uh, I, I feel I need to ask, um, though it, it probably shakes the roots of what we're trying to do around uh, research into student mental health. But M Michael Barber is asking us whether uh, whether we're right to be focusing on student mental health at all, because we know that most students coming into university, uh, um, oh, sorry, 
most most nah let me try this one again um most of the mental health problems that we're seeing in university students predated their move to university they were struggling with their mental health before they moved to university so the whole agenda of looking at student mental health perhaps it's misplaced and we need to be directing that research um to the school space to make sure that we're addressing the problems there early on um what what do we think about that do, do we all need to pack up and go home uh, john yeah i mean michael's just just wrong basically he's misunderstood what mental health means um and it's good that he's moving on um so but i i i think what we've got here is exactly as catherine's pointed out in the chat a kind of just confusion of language mental health is not the same as mental illness or indeed uh, a, you know some of the let's call them mental health difficulties even though it's, that's unhelpfully vague um, so i think it's clear and it's true that nearly 17 percent of 17 to 19 year olds um, have experienced a mental illness um, in, in the previous year that, that that they were surveyed by the national household survey reported by nhs digital and we would expect that proportion to come into universities so there is a responsibility for universities to support the experience of those people who have a chronic mental illness um, universities also have a responsibility to students who are experiencing mental distress which may be short term may not express as chronic mental illness but needs support and needs join up with the health sector in order to keep them safe and especially if they're moving towards suicidality or self-harm but finally and and really importantly and it's been in the chat here i i think well-being our health and well-being underpins our life satisfaction our success our success as organizations and as individuals and if universities are not about well-being underpinning learning underpinning research then they're underperforming as organizations and as communities of learning so built into that performance should be an understanding of how well-being and health drives our success in everything that we do, including our own individual success, uh, our life satisfaction, and our happiness. There we are. I, I, I'm off the soapbox now, Nicola, but Michael just has kind of completely missed the point. It's a shame that that's been such a prevalent view in the senior team at uh, Office for Students over the last period as well. I think I think Sally in the in the chat has a lovely suggestion for us that perhaps we need to think about working collaboratively with colleagues in education, perhaps before the higher education space to think about how we look at it together and certainly across the mental health research networks. That's what we're trying to do, working with our colleagues that work um, in the school space. And Ellie, I know you want to come in here. Yeah, I, I sort of want to come in and offer a possible middle ground. I don't think it's a middle ground as such. I, I'm more swaying towards John's approach. I think it depends what we think a university is meant to do. So, you know, as, as well as being at King's, I work at another university that has the highest uh, disability rates uh, across the UK and, um, you know, it has excellent levels of support. But I think we have to think about what the role of the university is. If a student comes to us with severe mental illness, then of course we have to support them in their studies, support them in the transition. It's not necessarily the university's role, of course, to provide specialist mental health care to that person, but rather to make sure they are linked up with services, especially if they've had to move, you know, from a, a different area where they may have lost their um, support network. So our role is to ensure that students who come to us with existing mental illness are, are able to connect up with the appropriate support. And of course, we can also from an education point of view, um, you know, there are things that can be put in place to support those students, which is, is happening at most universities at, at King's, it's the King's Inclusion Plan, but there'll be other things elsewhere. But I think going, so, so if, if the question is, we don't, we shouldn't be dealing with these people because they came to us like that, then I completely agree with John's point, that's not it. But what we, what we should be doing is we've got those group of students who need ongoing support and it's our role as a university to support them in their studies, support them in the transition to university and anything connected to the university, but importantly to give them 
uh, make sure they're in touch with the relevant services if they have had to move from another country or another area. But actually what the bigger issue is, and I always say this to some of my students and I have had, you know, my, my experience of those that have struggled the most is that they did come to university having already experienced problems. But I always say to them, you know, I, I would rather you come to us in one piece and you leave us in one piece with a two one, then you come to us in one piece and you leave us a mess with a first. So, you know, our, our aim is to add to, the per, add to the value to the person in their education, in their well-being, in everything. And we can only do that if we're being supportive of everybody. Um, and, and I think that's probably where most of the focus needs to go. It's that supporting of everybody. But we should also make sure that students that wouldn't have been able to go to university 30 years ago because of health problems, they are now able to go and they should be there and they should be supported as far as the university possibly can. Thank you, Ellie. And you, you echo a comment that, that Pamela's put in the chat that, that universities really have a duty beyond, beyond all of this to, to make sure they're not exacerbating illness. Um, Nicola, I just so come in because it's very funny. Laura's just pointed out to me that the Michael Barber who asked that question or, or uh, talked about schools is not the Michael Barber who's the chair of the office for students, but a different Michael Barber. So I apologise to the real Michael Barber, but my comments still hold about the other Michael Barber. A wonderful name confusion. Okay, right. Um, I think I've got time to ask what, one final question, which has sort of jumped across the topics over the last uh, over the last two days. And we've seen a recognition in, in some of the earlier panels that perhaps we need to shift from focusing on developing new interventions and understanding uh, the, 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 the landscape and, and think about how do we implement what we know already is there enough research going on around implementation science to, to study to understand how interventions get implemented effectively, how policy changes get, into, uh, get implemented effectively? Do, do we understand enough about this? Jo John, can I come to you? Yes, I mean, you know what my answer is there. Uh, we, we have the tools um, around evaluating complex system changes. We're doing it in other areas. Um, and we just need to get on and deploy them. Uh, it's, it goes back to the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary question. It needs, it needs some urgency. Um, it needs a bit of funding. Uh, it needs senior teams to buy in, but I think they are. They are buying it now. Um, and we can do it and we should do it. Yeah, simple answers. Fantastic. Well, I think I'm going to I'm going to stop there because it's nice to end with a with a simple simple answer. Um, I, I've heard across this panel that we're we're really trying to tackle some some difficult questions, and we've moved to to really understand tr trying to understand how we make big system changes. And this is hard research to do. It, it takes an interdisciplinary approach, which is challenging. And as several of you several of my panel have pointed out, it it takes substantive funding to support. Um, and, and institutional support to make it happen. I, I want to say an, an enormous thank you to my panel, um, but, for, but also to all of you in the audience for joining, for feeding us such fascinating questions um, and, and contributing so richly to the discussion in the chat. I've been following along throughout, throughout the discussion and it's, um, I'm, I'm really humbled to have such amazing, interesting uh, individuals. And I, I hope that perhaps uh, over the years ahead, we keep working together. Um, and, and I have every confidence that with this diverse team that we, we can over the years ahead, make some real progress around student mental health. Um, so, so thank you all.